And our passage is Ezekiel chapter 22, verses 1 through 31. Our message title this evening is The Sins of Israel Spelled Out. And so if you've been with us and we've been finished, we finished our, our series last week talking about uh, God being just, uh, the last one, the last part is divine responsibility and that belongs to the Lord. And so we're going to talk a little bit and tie that in with uh, tonight's study. So let's go ahead and pray one more time. So Lord, we're grateful that you give us an opportunity to be just casual, Lord, to come in and take in a, another Bible study, Lord. And uh, we know that your word does not return void. And we know, Lord, that tonight you even point out to us, you give us a little tidbit about uh, if you don't come soon, then we certainly want our lives to be healthy and long, Lord. And uh, uh, your word gives us that, that insight of how that's going to happen, Lord. <coughs> so I pray, Lord, that you, Holy Spirit, would be our teacher once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so... As we concluded chapter 21, right, we were speaking about divine responsibility. And in our series entitled God is Just, we learned that God was going to use Babylon as his sword, right? Remember, it was polished for slaughter, if you may, right? And uh, for consuming his people whom they were just bent on ignoring him with unrepented hearts. You never want to get there with the Lord. You know when we fail. You know when we fall short. And it's good for us to come to the Lord and say, Lord, are you, I've blown it. I've blown it again. And, and we, if you come to the Lord with that contrite heart, the heart that's, that's sincere about you recognize you blew it, you know, the Lord forgives us. He's the one that told us 70 times 7 we should forgive someone else. And he wouldn't be giving that advice if he wasn't willing to do it himself. He wouldn't be giving us not so much advice, but that word of life for us if he wasn't going to do that for yourself. So for Christians, especially mature Christians, uh, guys and gals that have been walking with the Lord for a while, don't keep junk in your hearts, right? Give it to the Lord, ask him for forgiveness, and start over wherever it is you are at. So this evening, in chapter 22, we will learn why. Why? As Father God spells out Israel's sin uh, before the sword slaughters and consumes. So we ended last, last week, man, that chapter was, you know, God has his sword. It is shiny. It is ready to cut through people. And you would say, why? Right? Before it comes, it's coming down. But before it comes, God spells out Israel's sins. So when we read and we hear these things, uh, most of us aren't into this. Most of us, when we see that, well, that's not me. That's when you could say, that's not me. And it surely it isn't us. But how we get things right with the Lord is very important. And so the message for them uh, was going to be clear. Because they're all thinking, well, how could God allow this to happen? Why does God allow this to happen? And so he's going to spell it out for us. But um, we are the ones that are supposed to be learning from uh, Israel's past mistakes. All right. So again, uh, here then is an outline for us for tonight. Right? We're gonna ex the there's an explanation for Israel's judgment. So from verses two through sixteen, we're going to see that explanation, and then from verses seventeen to twenty-two, we're going to see how that judgment is going to come, and then finally verses twenty-three through thirty-one, who will be judged uh, by him? So let's begin. Verse one. Moreover. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Now, son of man, will you judge? Will you judge the bloody city? Yes, show her all her abominations. And then say, Thus says the Lord God, The city sheds blood in her own midst, that her time may come, and she makes idols within herself to defile herself. You have become guilty by the blood which you have shed, and have defiled yourself with the idols which you have made. You have caused your days to draw near, and have come to the end of your years. Therefore, I have made you a reproach to the nations, and a mockery to all countries. Those near and those far from you will mock you as infamous and full of tumult. So 
Infamous. What is that word infamous? Infamous means the person is famous for something that wasn't good. Al Capone. How many of you guys have heard of Al Capone? Famous for gangster murder, right? And things like that. So when you think about people who have committed horrible crimes, Lee Harvey Oswald, my generation, who remembers Lee Harvey Oswald? Infamous. Why? Because he did horrible things. He's the one that they said assassinated President John F. Kennedy. So God says, I'm going to make you infamous. That means Israel, all the nations are going to say, oh yeah, the Jews, <laughs> yeah, the Jews, the ones that totally turned their back on God. Brothers, sisters, you don't want to be infamous. Nothing wrong with being famous, right? But infamous, everybody knows you because you blew it. That is a horrible reputation, but that's what that word means. So, again, from verse 1, right, uh, we learn that the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. Church, remember that Ezekiel is one of the captives. He's in Babylon, right? He's put away out there. Uh, and, and that shows us, and it tells us that God can speak to us no matter where we're at. Right now we're in Montrose, Colorado. But what if your company send you on an adventure to South America and you had to take a boat on the Amazon or something, and then you didn't know which way to take, come, take. There's a fork in the road, and you got lost on the river, and you got lost. And so you start crawling back, and you're trying to get back, and there's no signs. USA, 15 million miles that way. There's nothing like that, right? So there you go. You find a little place to spend the evening, start a little fire, and you go before the Lord. How many of you guys know that God will hear your prayer from where you're at, right? God will hear your prayer. God will hear that faintest cry no matter where you're at. You could have gone off the cliff and you're sinking in a car. And, uh, you know, you're seeing the little bubbles go bloop, bloop, and it's starting to fill up. God will hear your cry. Ezekiel is in Babylon. Ezekiel is way far from Jerusalem. God's going to speak about those that have remained in Jerusalem until the end, right? It's not going to be good. But here's the point. God is speaking to, Jerusalem, to Ezekiel. God will speak to you no matter where you're at. You could be going down the street on a skateboard, on a bicycle, on a car. If you pray to the Lord, he will hear you. And if he has something for you, he will share that with you on your bicycle trip or on your skateboard trip. That's how our Lord is, right? So God can speak to us no matter where we are. And, of course, this can be good or it can be bad. The, it is good when he comforts you through his word, right? The Bible, when you're in need of it. But it could be bad when you have hardened your heart against him, and all you can remember is hearing a, a, a song or a, a preacher or a teacher share something that you knew that was, they were talking to you, but you never paid attention to it, and yet now God is speaking to you because he's going to uh, discipline you. So indeed... His word again speaks to you. It reveals your sin, and he does it here in verse 1. He's speaking to him. From verse 2, uh, God is calling Jerusalem <coughs> a bloody city. He's calling his city a bloody city. And, and through verse 16, the word blood or bloody, right, or even bloodshed is repeated around seven times in just this short window of Scripture. So what does it tell you about Jerusalem? Bloody city at this time. Bloody means murderers. It means people setting up people so the justice system can kill them. In the old days, the wild, wild west, oh, what do you think? He robbed the bank. And the crowd says, hang him. And they would hang the person, right? This is what it means, you know, people who would have others falsely accused and, uh, and then the justice system would, would uh, terminate them. So God says that this city uh, sheds blood uh, it's a bloody city. So it's repeated. From verse 3, we learn that the city has, as we say, shot themselves in their own foot. Right? They shot themselves in the foot. How many of you have heard that expression before? And what does it mean? You're working against yourself. You are doing something against yourself. Dude, you're just shooting yourself in your own foot. You're not going to progress. It's not someone outside that's, that's making life miserable. It's you are making life miserable for you. So, the city sheds blood in her own midst. It, it's her. It, they are the problem, right? She makes idols within herself to defile herself. 
If you're making something bad, if you're fabricating a gun so you can go and rob a bank, you're the one that's doing this. You're doing something wrong. She was, Israel, fabricating idols when she knows that God says, you will have no other God before me. You will not have these idols before me. This is not for you. Get your eyes off the foreign nations. And the foreign nations all had their gods. The foreign nations always had um, many gods, right? The Lord says to her, why do you do this? Why have you done this? Why won't you repent of this? So it says, you have made idols to defile yourself. And let's look at that last part. That last part of verse, that her time may come. Well, what does that mean? Church, that means that her judgment will come sooner than later. We always want a little bit, bit of more time. But it's, they're, not, they're cutting themselves off. They are not going to have more time. That's why he says, you know, her judgment may come sooner than later. Today, look across the United States of America, right? Look across. America seems to be shooting herself on her own foot. This is a country that is divisive, political lines, and we have created hatred, right? I'm talking about the nation as a whole. I mean, bad is good, good is bad. We've been talking about that, but it's never been so much in our face. And sin has never been flaunted as much as it is in our faces, in our schools today. So America is shooting herself on their own foot uh, with their flaunting of their sins before God. Uh, her time, here it is, will come sooner than later as well. If the Lord had somewhere in his calendar said America's going to last another 200 years, but the way we're going right now, you know, might never make it. Who knows it will be here six weeks, six months. Because our country continues to shoot itself on the foot. Every seems like the laws that are being passed right now, we're just shaking our heads. How could they do this? How can we do this? And yet, our country is doing things that are really, really backward, if you may, and offensive to our Lord. From verse 4, God is saying that the Jews in Jerusalem are guilty of bloodshed, then, that they're guilty of fabrication of their own idols. And also here we learn that the city then has come to its end. What? It's the end of Jerusalem? Yeah. What if you heard tomorrow in the paper, Montrose will come to the end before uh, June 1st gets here? You know, Montrose going to be, you would say, how could this be? Can this really be? Well, the Jews are hearing, especially the captives are hearing, but the word's going to get back to those who are in Jerusalem. Or maybe it will, maybe it won't. But he says, your city, the great Jerusalem, King David's city, is going to come to an end. Nobody saw this coming. The, the false prophets would say, God would never do this. It's his temple. Oh, we're Christians. This will not. If we are messed up Christians, trust me, these things come. Judgment comes. None of us are beyond uh, God's discipline if we harden our hearts, if we keep our sins, if we continue to fabricate and do these things that God is against. And so the city then is coming to an end. And they, the Jews, have caused it. They caused it. So church, the people who were left in Jerusalem, those yet not taken captives, they were thinking pretty high of themselves. They were thinking, well, you know, they removed the Jones family. Yeah, but the Jones family, you know, maybe you didn't know this about the Jones family, but they were a little crooked sometimes. No. And the Smiths are gone. Yeah, the Smiths are gone too, but there certainly there had to be something. Well, we're still here. Well, maybe we're just a little bit more holier than everybody else. That's why we're still in Jerusalem. They had no clue that the ones that were gone are the ones that would have the opportunity to live and their children live to start lives afresh in Babylon, and at the end of 70 years, they would come. But these that were staying, staying behind, they were thinking high and mighty of themselves that there was something special about themselves, which, which makes us think about this. You know and I know that we are to humble ourselves. That's, that's the, what the Lord says. Humble yourself, and he will lift you up. And for those of us that don't get it, it means humble yourself. Right? Uh, don't take the high road, you know. I mean, don't take the high road meaning that you're show-offy and whatnot. Don't take the high road meaning that you think you're higher and mighty than anybody else, right? Humble yourself. 
right? And so they didn't humble themselves. But we know we should. These guys that were in Jerusalem still, they uh, thought pretty highly of themselves. And, and um, they hear Ezekiel prophesy that the Jews would be mocked by those near and far. There's the other part of uh, verse 4. That uh, God says that they're going to be mocked near and far. And then we get to verse 5. From verse 5, I want to read to you a little commentary by Pastor John Corson. He makes a great observation uh, that, quote, near and far speaks... Not only geographically, but historically. And he also knows that the Jews have felt mockery and anti-Semitism both throughout the world and throughout history. You see, they turned away from the Lord and they have paid the price for their rebellion. The Jews have, I don't, I don't know how it was when you were growing up and prejudices against the Jews, jokes against the Jews, this and that against the Jews, Right? But they brought this on to themselves. And so God said, you know, you had it all. You were supposed to share it all with all these nations that were still making idols out of wood and, you know, doing all this and that and gold and stone. And you guys had the, an opportunity to share the truth with them, how we came into being, where we're going, life after death. You, you had that privilege and you didn't do it. You became inclusive. Oh, only us Jews are important. Don't touch me, pagan man. You know, you defile me and all this and that. Right? They were like, uh, oh, they were always washing it. They bumped into you in the marketplace and whatnot. Total opposite of what the Lord had for them. So the Lord said, when I scatter you, you're going to be uh, in a bad place. And when I scatter you, you will be the minority. And when you're the minority and you're scattered and God is against you, it's not going to go well for you. So the people would mock them, right? It would be a bad thing. It's interesting. God loved his people then. And let me say this to you. He loves his people today. God loves his people today, right? However, as the author of the book of Hebrew writes, he tells us in Hebrews 10.31, quote, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now think about this. You know, if you think you can joke around with the Lord, guys, get a clue here. You should know that it is a fear. You're talking about be, getting into danger, really messing up bad. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of living God. God is not dead. The God of yesterday is our God today. And you know what he has spelled out for us. And you can't be messing around with what he's laid out for us. Especially we older Christians. You can't take it for granted. You start thinking, well, going to church is the same old, same old. What have we done? We have stopped being in awe of our God and reverencing him and giving him our full 100% devotion. We can't let ourselves slip into mediocrity with the Lord. We have to continue to go forward. Church Israel did fall into the hands of our living God, and so will America if she does not repent. If America does not change her ways, it's only a matter of time where God has to judge this nation. This nation that he protected, this nation that he provided for. It's interesting how we know that the uh, pilgrims came across the seas. We know that Israel went across the Red Sea. We know that when the pilgrims came and they needed to, to uh, exist now to provide for themselves, we know that God on the other side of the Red Sea provided for his people. We know that when they followed the Lord, the Lord gave them victory. When America was following the Lord, there was no army that has ever been as strong as the United States of America. But what has happened now? You know, when our Navy is using uh, transgen transgenders, to be the, the Uncle Sam, I need you of the past to come on and join the Navy boys, you know, type of thing. The world is laughing at us. The countries around America are saying, what in the world happened to her? The one that was high and mighty and strong and blessed. Our fruit and plains, just think about the song America and how God had blessed us in every aspect of everything. The youngest country against Europe or against China or against Japan, they feared America as she was the strongest country in the world. 
our armies, our technology, everything that we had. You know, but look at how America behaves today. God will not be mocked. Whatever we sow, we will reap. And so we have sown, our country is sowing to foolishness and evil and all this stuff. God is going to judge America. It's just a matter of time. And when we say time, where we're at right now, in again, flaunting our sin in front of God as a country, it could be weeks. Fine, you want to say, hey, we need more time. Do you need more time? No one, when they have a heart attack, would have guessed they were having a heart attack. No one. In, 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 in the, our, our little cities, like Farmington last week that had a shooting, 18-year-old that was supposed to graduate this week, just started shooting. Another report came in. He was also just shooting at cars going by and whatnot. They killed him. Police killed them. Two officers were praying for them that they're recovering right now. You never know where it's going to happen. It could happen here in Montreal. Someone could bust through the doors right here and just begin shooting us. That's the kind of country we live in right now. What's happened to us? What happened to us? We have forgotten about God. As a whole, our country has put God aside, and we're marching with what we think or, you know, as a book of Judges. Everybody doing what they thought is right in their own minds. It is a bad place for us. So, again, uh, Israel did fall into the hands of our living God, and so will America if it doesn't repent. Verse 6 says this, Look, the prince of Israel, each one has used his power to shed blood in you. What's this saying? Again, it's America who's shooting himself in the foot. Right here, the leadership, the prince, right, of Israel. Instead of, you, you know what a noble kingdom is and how the king looks out for his people. And, oh, bring King Richard back, we used to say, and let him get back to Camelot, and, and he'll do good for, for the people. But when the evil king is in charge, it's bad for the people. Right here, that's the picture for us who went through that part of history, Right? The prince of Israel, each one has used his power because they're influential people, right, to shed blood in you, right? This is not outside of you. This is not talking about the outsiders. This was the Jews taking advantage of the Jews and setting them up for slaughter. So here we learn that the prince had abused their power, but God is going to display his power, right? The prophet Amos Recorded in the Old Testament book, Amos chapter 5, verse 11 through 17, that, quote, the officials in Jerusalem were accepting bribes and condemning innocent people to death so that others could claim their property. That's horrible. Think about that happening here in Manchos, right? Our judges saying, hey, uh, you didn't like the way your tax bill went up. Well, you know what? You know, I'm going to just put your house up for sale for whatever. Well, you can't do that. Kill the husband. The wife says, you can't do that. Kill the, the wife. And the kids, what are we going to do? Sorry, suffer. I'm going to sell your property to someone else. You say, what an injustice. This can never happen. The prince, the leadership of Israel, <laughs> they were doing these kind of things. They were shedding blood. They were accepting bribes, condemning innocent people so that others could claim their property. Verse 7, look at your Bible. In you, they have made light of father and mother. In your midst, they have oppressed the stranger. In you, they have mistreated the fathers and the widow. Church, here's some of the people were committing blatant sins. And so he begins with the abuse of people. They were abusing parents. They were abusing strangers. They were abusing the orphans. They were abusing the widows. Back in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, the Jews were commanded to honor their father and mothers, fathers and mothers. And guess what? So are we. I know it's Old Testament, but so are we. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 to 3, uh, today we are to honor our parents. Look what it says. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. Church, did you notice God's little promise at the end that you will live long on the earth? 
It's a great investment to honor your parents when you can, right? Uh, if the rapture doesn't happen in our lifetime, in your lifetime. You know, you want to, if, you're gonna, if we're going to remain on the earth, how do you want it to go for you? Good or bad? Do you want to be on the streets or do you rather be in your house, you know, having friends over for a barbecue every once in a while? Oh, geez, taxes went up. So what, honey? Write the check. You know, I mean, I mean don't you want it to go good? Therefore, we are to honor our parents. Of course, the ones, the, the, the loud voice is going to say, well, what if my dad was a molester? What if my dad or my mom was a this and that? What if that? Okay, I get you. You know, may God have mercy on you and whatnot. But as you grow and as you're not in that house anymore, and your dad, let's just say he's in prison now or in another state, uh, would you not grant forgiveness? Well, you don't know. I don't have to know. I know this. God has forgiven me of many things, and I could extend forgiveness to them. Doesn't mean that I'm going to invite them over to my household. And if, if dad was a, a, a molester or this and that, it doesn't mean that I would ever let my grandchildren spend the night at dad's house. We have to be wise. We have to be uh, wise as serpents, gentle as doves. But this whole thing about I hate him, I'll always hate him. <gasps> really? Who are you, you know, to have this kind of hate towards them? You don't have to have anything to do with this person or whatever. I, I understand that and I respect that. But to harbor that hatred in your heart, let it go. It's going to affect you more than anything else. When it comes up, you'll still go like, like if it was yesterday. Don't you realize that when you come to Christ, all things are new for you? For you. All things are new for you. So again, ask God to help you extend that forgiveness to them you know, and yet set your boundaries or limits or whatever things you have to do to make things right because you know up here and you know right here in your heart what is right. But this is what we have to do. What happens when one of your child, one of your kids, um, rapes someone else or murders someone else or whatever? Do they stop being your kid? Absolutely not. You're going to pray for them. You're going to be praying that a chaplain comes and visits them. You're going to be praying that somehow, somewhere, God will break through the darkness of their sin and whatever it was that they were into, right? And they find Jesus. Yeah. And then if you don't, then you must think you're worthy. Are you worthy? Is any one of us worthy of God's goodness? None of us. If it wasn't for him, where would we be? Right? So, yeah. Not easy. But... Respect them, and what does the Lord say? Honor them, and your life will be long on the earth. And there are some reasons why you can't and you wouldn't, I get that, but extend that forgiveness. Verse 8, you have, been dis you have despised my holy things and profaned my Sabbath. So church, they defiled the temple. They came into the temple. You don't go into church and do evil stuff. You know, a lot of our older generation uh, would say, to us today, hey, don't let the kids run around in church. My granddaughter has an airplane right there. She left in the front row, right? She flies the airplane in church and whatnot. They would say this and that. That's, that's not what they're talking about. If you come in here and start worshiping another God, set up a little idol in the corner, that's what he was talking about. If you profane God's holy things and you take the things that are, are used for him um, and, and use it in a way that's evil, complete evil, that's what he's talking about. Kids running around in church is not a sin. And I know that a lot of people, they, I, my, my dad's generation, you wouldn't have it. He'd give you a knuckle sandwich. You know, preacher was talking to you, you were just dozing. My dad would wake you up, pow, back of the head. Today he would go to prison for it. You know, but back in the day, that's just the way it was. They, I understand what they were trying to accomplish, but uh, as the Lord gives us light, as we move on, there's, there's other things, you know, other ways to handle that. I told you about Billy Graham, right? He was in seminary, and he's in his class. And uh, in his class, uh, the, the, prof, the, the professor was teaching, and the guy in front of Billy Graham fell asleep. I mean, just, you know, students live um, busy lives. You know, there's all kinds of things that students do, and they're always tired in the morning, right? So morning classes, some of them don't do well in. But anyway, the guy in front of Billy Graham fell asleep. And the professor was insulted. And so he looks across his, Billy, Billy, wake him up, wake him up. And Billy Graham is about to wake him up, and he says, uh, uh, Professor, 
you put them to sleep, you wake them up, you know. <laughs> so, so what does it tell you, you know? Don't get so uptight with things that, you know, you're, you're, we're from, a lot of us are from a different generation. It bugs us. But, you know, is it sin? No. No. Know your scripture that way. And it's not your battle sometimes. Pray for their parents. Are they flying kites in here or throwing planes in here? What are they doing at their house? Father, help them. But that's their house, you know. Um, pray for them. But love them, you know. Don't be making a kid feel like he doesn't belong in church. That's not a good thing for us to do. Correct them if they're wrong and doing something goofy. If I see a kid, let's put it this way. If I see your child, right, who stole daddy's blade and he's cutting across a chair, I'm not going to say, oh, how cute. Notice how he cuts up and down and he doesn't cut diagonally. That must mean, you know, all right? Hey, hey, son, give me the knife. You know, that's, that's not good. That wasn't good. Let's go talk to mom and dad. And when you go and talk to mom and dad, if you're smart, you would have closed the blade. And when you talk to mom and dad, hey, your son was like, mom and dad are already in shock, right? No, just kidding. Don't do those kind of things. <laughs> that was the flesh talking. <laughs> Don't do that, right? Okay, but that's what's going on, going on right? The people were not taking uh, time also so they were setting up idols. This is what it means. You have despised my holy things. You haven't valued them, right? Uh, and the second part was uh, they had profaned the Sabbath. Listen, the Sabbath again, when you talk about Saturdays, what was it for? Man, learn. God created this earth on six days. On the seventh day, he rested. For the Jews, that was Saturday, the seventh day, right? So the Lord's saying, why don't you just take some time with me? Think about the things I've done for you. So for us, of course, it's on a Sunday for us, the Sabbath is every day. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, so it's not something religious. But here's what he's saying to you. Don't you want to hang out with me? You know, you, you asked me for a job, and did I give you the job? You were looking for a contract, did I give you the contract? You wanted a car, did I not give you a car? You wanted a wife, did I not give you a babe? You know, you wanted this and that, did, have I not done this? Your child was born. For most of us who were in the world, when our wives got pregnant, we had our first baby. How many guys were counting the toes and the fingers of the little boy or girl because we were in drugs, when, you know, and we are always thinking that something's going to go wrong, right? God has blessed us, and all he says every day, but especially on Sunday for us, why don't you gather together? Why don't you think about me? Would you praise me? You know, would you just take some time and just spend it together with me? That's what the Sabbath was all about. For them to spend time with the Lord, can you just put your fields off for a second? Can you put even washing the car off for a second? Can you just do this and let's spend that time together? Do you know that in that day you can spend the time with the Lord? It's a great time. And then all of a sudden you have two hours or now. Yeah, go wash your car. Thank you, Lord. I could move my car and I got some nice soapy bubbles here and the dirt's coming right off and my car's going to look like new again. It's not a sin to do it, but do you get it? That the Lord just wants to spend time with you. And when you remember what he's done for you, you know, it gives you that heart of gratitude, that heart of, you know, Lord, you thought about me and you did this for me. And I received this just like, so a little one-on-one. -on -one, and the Lord's looking down and says, yes, I did, because I love you. You know, that's what these days were meant for. You know, just to spend a little time with the Lord. I hear guys tell me, oh, Sunday, man. I know, you know, I only got Sunday to rest and Sunday to do this or that. You can always rest. You know, you're going to be doing something else. What happens when we rest? We get up and get tired again doing something else, right? What happens when the Lord gives you a break? We enjoy that break, but then we're busy again. Some of us long for vacation. And about the fourth, fifth day of vacation, we're so tired, we long to go to work so we could rest again, right? We're, we're a fickle group. We are. But those days that the Lord says, you know, just wanted to spend some time with you, and now you won't even think about me. You don't even make an effort to go to church. You don't even make an effort to, you know, hang, read, a, read a page or two of the Bible. We don't even do that on a daily basis. I just want to spend time with you. I just want to talk with you. This is what he meant. That's the beauty of those things. Again, for the Jews, it was their Saturday. For us, it's every day spending time with the Lord, but especially on Sundays, the day that's marked out for us, that's a good thing for us. So, yeah. So, um, we don't want to make the mistakes that the Jews did back then. Again, they, God said, you haven't even thought about me. We don't want to make those mistakes. We want to learn from this and say, huh, Lord, if you point that out to them, help me learn not to do it. 
You know, uh, uh, someone that there's two people and the boss is saying to one, look, you know, next time you do this, do this this way and do that that way. If you're smart, you're listening to what the boss is saying to that person and you're making sure that you don't do and you take the advice that he's telling someone else. We take that for ourselves. And this is what the Lord wants us to do. When you look at this stuff that happened with the Jews and how the Lord called them on it, we say today, mm, I don't want the Lord to call me on that. I think I need to spend that little time with the Lord. Something like that. All right, we get to verse 9. Look at your Bible. In you are men who slander to cause bloodshed. I don't know if you could get any worse than that. To say this guy was this and that. You're slandering someone, right? You're, you're talking bad about him. But you're doing it to cause bloodshed so that someone else is going to do the dirty work for you. So in you, you guys were doing this among yourselves. In you are men who slander to cause bloodshed. In you are those who eat on the mountains. What does that mean? That they were going to the mountains not to pick, oh, huckleberries, oh, apples. They're so good. That's not what he's talking about. They would make picnic lunches and go and have an idol. They would bring their idols and they would uh, uh, enjoy that time with their idols. What they wouldn't do on the Sabbath with the Lord, they were doing with idols, going up and taking their Lunch is doing this and that. In your midst, they commit lewdness. And now here you go with some, some name of list here. Verse 10. In you, men uncover their father's nakedness. What does that mean? Like Noah and the boy saw dad drunk and naked. Oh, and one of them said, dad's naked. The other two, shut up, dude. Let's cover dad up. It wasn't that. It's that they uh, were making love to dad's wife. That's what it means. Their stepmoms or things like that. That's where it's going with that. In you, they violate women who are set apart during their impurity. Right? So that's where, you know, if the lady says, dude, I'm in my time, you know, the lady's menstrual cycle, whatever. I don't care. You are my wife. And that, 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 that is flat out baloney in the Old Testament. It's kind of like leave them alone for that week or whatever. Right? But it was a law for them and they were breaking that law. Right? 11, one commits abomination with his neighbor's wife. That's, ooh, you can imagine what that is, right? Another lewdly defiles his daughter-in-law. Another in you violates his sister, his father's daughter. If they had stepdaughters or, or stepbrothers and whatnot, can't be playing hanky-panky. Can't be doing that kind of stuff. The Lord's calling him. He's listing. What was our title? Sins of Israel are spelled out. So you're saying, Pastor, you shouldn't be talking about it. This is your Bible. It's rated R. Rated R means you read it and you understand it, right? If, if someone doesn't guide you and tell you you can't do these, where are you going to get this from? You think the school's going to tell you? The school's saying, no, it's okay to do that. Oh, yeah, it's okay to do that. If it feels good, do it. That, 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 that. That's the world. This is not the world, right? Twelve, in you, they take bribes to shed blood. Wow. You take usury and increase. Usury means you charge your brother's interest. The Jews were not to charge anybody interest for money that was loaned to them. Right? You don't charge another Jew, a fellow Jew, interest. I need uh, 100 bucks just to get to the month. All right, I'll, I got the 100 bucks. I'll lend you 100 bucks, but it's going to cost you 10 bucks. So at the end of the month, you owe me 110 bucks. You can do that with someone else, but you can't do it with your people. For us as Christians with one another, you know, think about these things. You know, what would happen to the Lord if you do something like that? If it's your family, if you're going to lend them the money, kiss your money goodbye. You already know. You're either going to lend it to them or you're not going to lend it to them. If you learned your lessons, you would say, ah, oh, geez, I'd love to help you, but I just can't. Why? Because the last five loans they never paid back. So you know why you're not lending the money. You're just saying, you know what? I would love to, but I can't. Right? But if you're not there yet, you know, lend them the money, but don't expect to see it back. Why? Because it's going to cause a riff with you. You're the ones going to be upset. Hi, they're not responsible. I lend them the 500 bucks and they've never paid me back. And what is it now? It turns into a, bit, a seed of bitterness in your heart. So either lend it or don't lend it. And if you lend it to your family, personal family, Kiss that money goodbye. Don't even expect it back. If they pay you back, praise the Lord. But don't expect it back because most of the time you're feeling cheated. You're feeling not valued, disrespected. 
why did you, you said you would pay me back and now you're not. Man, I'm telling you, don't go there. That'll happen once or twice in your lifetime. Don't raise your hand. It's already happened to you. But learn to, don't do it unless you could do without it. Don't even go there. It just causes problems. You have made profit from your neighbors by extortion. Now, it's, it's even worse than that. Well, I told you that I would do it for 10 bucks more, so pay me back 110 But now you say, you know what? Uh, I really need $25 more. What? Give me the $25 more, or I'm going to take it away. I'm going to tell everybody this and that. No, it's extortion. You know, you, you're, that's bad. And they were doing that to one another, and that's part of the sins being listed, being spelled out that they were doing. And have forgotten me, says the Lord. Again, we do bad things when we're not thinking about the Lord. When we forget about the Lord, man is wicked. We are just wicked people without the Lord. And so the Lord calls him on that and says, this is what you do without me. Right? So here Ezekiel is given a list that spelled out the sins of Israel. And these people would not repent. Could you imagine? God says, I've polished the sword, last chapter. I'm ready to slice and dice because, and it's coming down quick. Right? I'm going to consume you guys in the last chapter. But before he does it, he gives you the reasons why he's doing it. So you're not thinking, wow, God was really harsh. Oh, I don't want to serve that God. No, you want to serve a God who's just and who's not going to let things slide. Right? <coughs> so these people would not repent. God's prophets, <coughs> excuse me, had pleaded with them time and time and time again. But beginning with leadership and then backed up with corrupt judges and priests and false prophets, Israel didn't want God in their lives and chose to forget him. We're going to do this, live our own lives. 13, behold, therefore I beat my fist at dishonest prophet which you have made and at the bloodshed which has been in your midst. Can your heart endure or can your hands remain strong in the day when I shall deal with you? I, the Lord, have spoken and will do it. It frustrates the Lord. And if he had the hands, God's spirit, as we know, uh, it, it just frustrated him that his kids take advantage of his kids. If you have a family and your brother or your sister has taken advantage of you, your parents hurt when they find out. Your parents hurt. And so it is with God. He hurts when his kids, the Jews, or us today, right, are taking advantage of one another. It, it is a bad thing. So he has spoken and he will do it. 15, I will scatter you among the nations, disperse you throughout the countries, and remove your filthiness completely from you. What? Well, think about it. If, he, if their filthiness was growing when they were together in their beloved Jerusalem, hiding behind the religion, then God says, to deal with you, I'm going to have to scatter you throughout, that you're out there by yourself, right? 16, you shall defile yourself in the sight of the nations, then you shall know that I am the Lord. So can you not hear God's heart in this, right? It's like he is saying, guys, 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 you have forgotten me. You have become immoral in your lifestyles, right? You give me no choice. You give me no choice. I'm going to send you away from your homeland. I'm going to send you away from your beloved Jerusalem to burn out the filthiness out of you. That's why I'm sending you out of here, so that you can get a clue out there and return to me. Church, when a parent takes the keys away from junior or takes the keys away from, don't tell me what you're going to do, daughter, right? It's not because the parents hate them, but truly it's because the parent loves them, right? That's why they took your keys away. Not because they hated you, but because they love you and you're not coming up to par, you're not meeting your end of the bargain. So God, so too, God would take away Jerusalem. Could you imagine taking away their city, their beloved city? God would take away Jerusalem and God would take away their temple, right? Away from the Jews. And he would, verse 15 says, scatter and disperse them all over the world who would now make them the joke of the nations. So, buddy, you just came to my country. Where do you come from? Well, I come from a country called Israel. You're a Jew? 
yeah, I'm a Jew. <laughs> you guys are a bunch of knuckleheads, huh? You're the one that had the God that parted the sea. You're the one that had the God that did all these miracles, and you couldn't serve him because you were copying us and our gods and things like that, right? These Jewish guys, no matter where they go, what happens, God's going to uh, punish them. So he would make them a joke of nations today. Right? Let's talk about America today. Today, the nations around the world are laughing and they're joking about what America has become. Right? A big, sad joke is America in the eyes of other nations. It's bad. Um, that's why our news don't report what's going on in the other parts of the world. And they certainly are not going to let you know what they're saying about our country, about our military, about their thoughts. Well, why wouldn't anyone attack America today? You know, we, we just aren't what we used to be. So all of that to say this, forgetting God, whether it was the Jews then or it's America today, forgetting God is personal. It is personal. For a God who took care of our country, raised it up to what it is, and then we're just doing all the opposite. If he did this with, with the Jews and he took away their city, Jerusalem, right, the nation's capital, the everything for them, he scattered all the people. We look at that and we say, hmm, would he ever do it to us, to America? Well, what do you think is going to happen? I pray, and I like to say the scenario is this. The rapture of the church is going to happen before God deals with America, right? Because we have not been called to wrath. So he takes us out of here. Now you have like four cogs in a six cog wheel missing. So it's not going to go good. Transportation is a good. Transportation, this and that. Banks. I mean, just think about it. It's going to be a mess in America, right? Because millions will be gone. And then you think, I think the other nations say, I don't have even time to worry about them. Those guys imploded. That means they, they, we didn't blow up. We blew in, implode I mean, from the inside, right? That's a horrible thing to happen, but maybe that's what's going to happen. It's a sad thing. And why? <laughs> because America has forgotten God. So forgetting God is personal. We can't change our nation. You and I cannot change our nation. We can pray for her uh, kind of like Ezekiel did. And Jeremiah did, and the other prophets did for Israel. Did they change? Nope, not at this time. Will America change? Oh, it'd be great if she did. Time will tell. Again, the explanation for Israel's judgment. We talked about the explanation, verses 2 to 16. We have received the explanation as to why Israel will be judged. And we just saw her sins being spelled out. And now we have verses 17 to 22, and how would it come? So we're going to learn how it would come. Verse 17, the word of the Lord came to me, this is Ezekiel speaking, saying, Son of man, the house of Israel has become dross to me. How many of you guys know what dross is? Anybody? Well, we'll read a little bit more. Some of you do, right? They are all bronze, tin, iron, and lead in the midst of a furnace. They have become Dross from silver. So if you're ever purifying silver, they use like these little furnaces. They put the silver there. They heat it up. It starts melting, melting. It becomes liquid. And then this little like garbage stuff is on top. So the dross is all this little stuff. And so what is God saying? You have become dross to me. What's he going to do? Well, let's read on. Therefore, oh, uh, they are all bronze, tin, iron, and lead in the midst of a furnace. They have become dross from silver. 19. Therefore, thus says the Lord, because you have all become dross, therefore, behold, I will gather you in the midst of Jerusalem. All right, let's just hold up there. Remember, they were saying, well, they took the Jones family and they took the Smith family. Even Ezekiel was taken as a captive to Babylon. They're over there. But we're over here. We must be someone special. We must, not, we must be holier than the, everybody else. And what is God saying? I'm going to gather you like Jerusalem, like Jerusalem is my furnace. And I'm going to put you right there in the middle. So you're saying, oh, we must be this and that. And I'm going to burn, burn, burn until all of a sudden you are all the impurities. And I'm going to burn you up. Is what God is saying to them. That's going to be horrible. You did not want to be one of those left. Remember before Jeremiah said, look, why don't you guys surrender? What? Surrender. Go tell Babylonians that you, you messed up. Your city's messed up. You just want to do what's right. 
and you'll live. But they wouldn't do it. They said, God will never attack us with the Babylonians. Well, God said he'd use them as a shining sword, right? And now he is going to burn them. <laughs> so 20, as men gather silver, bronze, iron, lead, and tin into the midst of a furnace to blow fire on it, to melt it, so I will gather you in my anger and in my fury, and I will leave you there and melt you. How powerful and strong of language is that? Do you get it? This is horrific. Yes, says 21, I will gather you and blow on you with the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in its midst. As silver is melted in the midst of a furnace, so shall you be melted in its midst. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury on you. Well, think about it, church, again. Israel, in their desire to be like the other nations, right, and have all these idols, they taught themselves how to form silver, how to form uh, 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 um, these uh, metals, if you may, the silver, the bronze, the tin, they, they learn how to make the molds, and then they would heat this stuff up, and then it would melt, and then they have a little, I don't know, some kind of a monkey or whatever it is that they, they worship, right? And so they knew how to do this, and the Lord says, you know how to do this? And then he uses the same thing. Well, I am going to do that to you. I am going to burn you because of all your sins. We just read a list of their sins. They are horrific. You would agree. What you reap, you will sow. Right? So God says he would do that. So now God would melt them, purifying them in the fires of the furnace that Jerusalem would become. Church, what fires in the USA do you remember? What famous fires? Well, the first one that comes to mind to me all the time is the Chicago fires, right? Do you remember that? How about the Twin Towers at 9-11? You know, those just burned, right? They're pretty famous. In our own state, the Hayman Fire burned 35 miles north uh, west of Colorado Springs in 2002, and it held the title of the largest uh, fire in Colorado's history for 18 years. So we know what fire can do. When we read and hear that Jerusalem was burned down by the Babylonians, you have God's word on this. Uh, it was horrific. When you know that God, you're going to hear, you, history tells you the Babylonians came in not only destroyed Jerusalem, but it burned it up. It burned up its palaces. It burned up its gates. It burned up um, uh, the temple. It burned them all to ruins. You know, And we who know what fires do, this is exactly what God would do. So thus we see Israel in the furnace. So 2.16 gave us the explanation, right? Uh, verse 17 to 22, how it would come? It would come through God making Jerusalem a furnace, right? That's how it would come, Israel in the furnace. And now lastly, verse 23 to 22, who would be judged by it? Who would be judged by it? All right, let's go to verse 23. And the word of the Lord came, and the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, say to her, you are a land that is not cleansed or rained on in the day of indignation. Church, we know how much you and I appreciate uh, rain when we are going through a drought. But here, on the day that the Lord's anger, his indignation comes, on the day that it comes, no amount of rain is going to cleanse them. They will not be refreshed. 25, the conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion, lion tearing the prey. They have devoured people. At least their souls. They have taken treasure and precious things. They have made many widows in her midst. So here we learn that Israel's false prophets, imagine now the pastors in Montrose alone, just the, all the pastors here, right? They got together and we conspired together, right, to lie to the people, to back up the uh, leadership as the leadership was ripping off the people. Accusations were being made, and we would tell the people, well, you know, thus says the Lord, uh, that when six or more priests get together, that uh, this is his word, you know, so you're wrong. And people, we're innocent. This is not what we did. Well, this is what was going on. They didn't stand up, the priests, 
the prophets, they didn't stand up for right as crimes and murders were occurring. They were all in cahoots and turned a deaf ear to the husbands being dragged off to court and then killed, leaving their wives as widows. They never stood up for them. 26, her priests have violated my laws and profaned my holy things. They have not distinguished between the holy and the unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean. And they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. There was not a Jew that wanted to work on Saturday, but the Jew says, hey, you guys got to keep working to keep these things going. You got to do this and that. God's going to excuse you, you know, this and that. God says, you profane my name. These guys hate the Sabbath because they're working, but you made that happen. You did not stand up and say, we're not working on Saturday. God said we can't work on the Sabbath. They never stood up for that. They just let it go on. So the priests had failed in their jobs of keeping God's worship pure. They were supposed to teach the people how to live right before God, but again, they were in cahoots, all living wrong before the Lord. They let worship slip down to just going through the motions. And so if you let worship just go through the motions, then you refuse to teach the people. So they had become slackers, if you may. Listen, friend. When what we do for God slips down to, ah, it's no big deal. We are no longer giving God reverence, if you may, uh, the reverence that he deserves. So to fix that, we need to repent. We need to come before the Lord. And instead of bringing God down to our level, we need to rise up to his level. That's what has to happen with us. 27. Her prints in her midst are like wolves tearing the prey to shed blood, to destroy people, and to get dishonest gain. Her prophets plastered them with untempered motor, seeing false vision and divining lies for them, saying, thus says the Lord God, when the Lord had not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and needy, and they wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So from verse 27, uh, we have to ask, when is enough money, when is enough property and possessions enough that the prince, the guys that are in charge, the leadership, why did they have to be like wolves taking advantage of the common people? Enough wasn't enough for them. Destroying them for dishonest gain. From verse 28, when we read the prophets plastered the people with untempered mortar, means that they would say to the people again, thus says the Lord and God hadn't said. But if you start using religion to kind of justify you and whatnot, that's like untempered mortar. You're using the wrong things. God doesn't want that at all. God had not said a word to them. They were lying to the people. From verse 29, we learn that the corruption of the prophets, priest and prince, now has been fully uncovered. Jerusalem had become an evil city for the most part. They were an evil, evil city. 30. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath and I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. So from verse 30, when we read about the wall, the wall is not one made out of stone, but rather a people who would stand up against evil. They're the wall that would say, you know what, you're doing this, but we're not going to do this. We're going to stand up for the Lord. We're not going to close our church down because the rest of the world is closing down. It's wrong. We're going to stand up and do what we have to do and stand for the Lord. That's the kind of wall he's talking about, right? Um, listen. We know that if there had been 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, God would have not destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Remember, it went down, well, if there's 50, if there's 40, if there's 10, if there's 10, God would not have destroyed it, right? He would have spared, he would have spared it, right? So too, God found no one to stand in the gap for him when he was going to come and judge Jerusalem. So he, he didn't have to do it had there been someone, but there was no one there. And finally, from verse 31, with the sins of Israel spelled out, God would judge them with fire, the fire of his wrath. 
paying them back for all their wicked deeds that they had committed against him. So again, you know, and lastly, who would be judged by it? <laughs> Israel's wicked leaders, number three, would be judged. So as we close this, this evening, obviously Israel needed a total reconstruction, and God was about to give it. But for us, for us, when you and I are faking it, that is, when we give an appearance that we love God, but we are not living his way, we are covering up sins, if you may. Uh, we're covering them up, and they could eventually damage us beyond repair. Israel could not be repaired anymore. They got to a place that they wouldn't be, couldn't be repaired. So for you and I, let's not use religion as a whitewash. Let's fix the, fix the problem. And we fix the problem by applying the principles that are here for us laid out in God's word, right? None of us want our sin spelled out, right? As God did with Israel. Therefore, repent of your sins. You know, come back to the Lord. His blood washes away our sins. And he makes us, as the song says, white as snow before the Lord, right? Listen, we're human beings. None of us are perfect. We said on Sunday that all have come short of the glory of God. We all fall short. The word all means, you know, so it's all of us. In attitudes and things that, that uh, we do sometimes or things that we don't do, no one would stand up for what was right for the Lord. They all caved in to the, what was bad. The priests would turn their eyes this way when someone, the leadership was doing something wrong that, over there. We can't do that. We have to stand up for what's right. May we be wise before the Lord, wise as serpents and gentle as doves. Father God, we thank you for this chapter. May we have learned from it, Lord, and may we be aware that you are the living God and you deal justly, Lord, when things have gone wrong and you trying to get us right, when we don't respond, you judge us, Lord, because you love us. So, Lord, I pray that we would have softened hearts before you, Lord, that we would right the wrongs, understand what you have done with them, Lord, so to keep us, Lord, uh, from going down harm's way, Lord. Help us to be pure before you, Lord, to the best of our abilities. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.